Guys, we need to have a chat, all right? This is getting completely out of control, all right? I know that everyone in GBG wants to be like an amateur Italian chef, right? I understand that you guys love to make spaghetti, but you gotta stop. You gotta stop. Today, I'm gonna talk about spaghetti code and how to make your code not look like absolute garbage. Because I think we can all agree that this looks better than, is there no, hold on. Oh my God. I pressed the wrong button. What the fuck is this abomination? I can't even see green anymore. For the record, that was a real live reaction on stream. First, I'll explain to you the reason why you want to make code that doesn't look like actual vomit. Second, I'll highlight many common pitfalls that people fall into. Lastly, I'll discuss tricks to make your code a lot more legible. I don't like to flaunt my qualification, but I think it's relevant for this video. I'm a scientist. I'm not a dedicated programmer, but I have been programming for 15 years. I've had to do code for small projects, big projects, with groups, on my own. This includes all sorts of programming for either simulations or for operating machines, processing data, etc. I'm bringing this up because this video is gonna be extremely judgmental and I need you to understand where I'm coming from. First, I need to explain why we care about making code that isn't absolute trash. This level features an AI that is really good at shooting and aiming at you. And so let's say that I wanna make a level like this that contains this AI. You see that this code is very thoroughly organized and commented, which makes it a lot easier to figure out, okay, what is the code that controls this aspect of how the AI works to remix it for your own level or copy the code exactly, etc. From my personal experience, the most likely person to have to go back and look at your code to figure out how it works is yourself in the future. This is because people like to do similar things repeatedly, all right? Like if I like to make levels where I have AIs that follow the player or shoot projectiles at the player, I'm much more likely to make another level that also features an AI that shoots at the player or chases the player. So let's say in the future, I wanna make another AI kind of like this. So I look at, oh, how did I do this? Or, you know, I wanna remix it or make some modifications to it, etc. And I find this, what do you do with this? This could be anywhere from a week from now to a year from now. You're not gonna remember exactly how everything worked. When you do this, you are basically leaving your future self an incomprehensible mess of garbage to sift through. At this point, the code is basically useless because it'd take you as much time to figure out what's going on in this mess as to just make it fresh from scratch, at which point you didn't actually save any time by looking at your old code. The point I wanna stress here is that everyone is affected by this. You can ask any software developer, any programmer, anyone who's done some amount of programming ever. They will tell you this a hundred times over. This is super important. You need to organize your code. It needs to be legible. You need to be able to understand what's going on. Because if you don't, your code is absolute garbage. And everyone has their own personal horror stories for when they had to go through their own code or through someone else's code and it was incomprehensible trash. I'm sorry to come at you as an indignant, angry preacher, but this talk has to happen. Some people will say, who cares if it's messy? It's just a child's game. Well, you're gonna take that same exact habit and that same exact mentality into real life. And you're gonna make garbage code for everyone else to hate you. One very common complaint is who cares as long as the creator can make a really cool creation. Like, look at this, this is Tetris. Isn't this really cool? Wouldn't you love to know how it works? Well, too bad, there are no comments, so good luck with that. Now that we've established why you want to have good style when coding, even in GBG, let's talk about some of the very common pitfalls. Here, you'll notice that this amazing Tetris game has absolutely no comments. You'll see this happen all the time in super popular levels where they reach the note on limit. And so you'd say, oh, well, it's a really cool level and he's at the note on limit. So he can't really spare any note ons for comments because God forbid any of this be comprehensible at all. I don't know who taught you this or where you picked this up or why you think this is acceptable, but not commenting your code is the fastest way to make garbage. Comment notes are super powerful tools to organize your code so you understand what is what. I understand that comments cost nodons and you know, it's not the same as comments in programming because in programming, there's no nodon limit. And I can tell you that you have the exact same problem in programming where people don't comment their code even when there's no equivalent of a node on limit. Don't you dare use the node on limit as an excuse to not comment your code. Why are you so angry? Because I am. If you're at the node on limit, the solution is not to cut out comments until you have enough node ons to do what you have to do. Your boss doesn't need that eighth different attack pattern. 
Your forest will still be fine without that 12th tree. Your FPS will be fine with eight bad guys instead of nine. Even in my own levels, when I hit the node on limit, I still have to make room for comments so that this code will be somewhat comprehensible in the future. So you can tell this code is for checkpoints and this code is all the tank. This may mean that you need to scrap an obstacle in order to have enough nodons for comments as well. And that's completely acceptable. What is not okay is to leave your magnum opus as indecipherable trash. And I'm positive that developers in the audience will absolutely smite you for doing otherwise. Sorry, I had to get that off my chest because there are so many novice coders out there who will bafflingly argue against commenting your code. If you ask how many comments does your code need, the answer to that is as many comments as are necessary to understand it. But I can tell you that for almost every level you make, zero comments is too few comments. Not everyone who defends spaghetti code has probably rage quit the video. Let's focus on some specific pitfalls for GBG that will help make your code a lot cleaner. One common mistake that people will do is tie together different blocks of code that are really far apart from each other. Like here, even when fully zoomed out, in order to get to these different blocks of code, you need to basically travel all across the map in order to see what's going on. You could put the code really far away in the map, so even when you fully zoom out, you have to keep scrolling for several minutes to get to where you need to, or don't. The opposite problem, which you find very frequently, is people putting their code too close to the gameplay area. So here you see a lot of the game logic and a lot of the input nodons, etc. those are inside of this gameplay area. Here with all those objects, that's actually the region where you're gonna be playing. And when you're making a little gameplay area, you want to be able to easily see what the shape of this area is. In general, it's a lot better for this code to not be in the main gameplay area. For example, this car, which is in the gameplay area, is controlled by a large amount of code over here that controls the logic for the car's motion. That way, you don't have all of this code going on in the main gameplay area, which is already very busy. Another very common mistake is to make your nodons different sizes that make seemingly no sense. Like some of them are like slightly different shapes or rectangular, bigger, smaller, etc. Here, there's not really a discernible clear pattern. Here is another example, and another example, and another example, and another example. You can't help this with object nodons that have to be certain sizes, but when it comes to logic nodons, while you can change your shapes a little bit to sometimes make code more readable, there needs to be an obvious pattern that you can pick up on. It can be very confusing and unhelpful when you have nodons of completely different sizes and shapes just kind of like jammed into some space. Sometimes it can be helpful to change the shape and size of your nodons in order to highlight different parts of your code which may be more important or to organize things more neatly. But when you do this, try to keep to only a couple of different shapes and sizes so that it's relatively easy to read and does not look like a mess. People also sometimes go really nuts with scale. For example, where is this person's controls? You don't see them? How about now? 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 How about now? Yeah, I shouldn't have to zoom in this far in order to see your code. Whenever your scales are so vastly different that you need to really zoom all the way in or out in order to see the nodons themselves, it makes it hard to read your code. Another common issue is to pile many nodons on top of each other, which makes it very difficult to read them. While it's understandable that this can happen for object nodons because you gotta make the shape of your level somehow, there's not really a good excuse to do this with logic or input-based nodons like here with constants and buttons. The next common problem is to arrange your code such that you have very long connections going everywhere. In general, you want to arrange your nodons in your code so you don't have as many giant pink or blue lines streaking across it. Next, and this is very important for 3D levels, GBG shows you projections in either XY or XZ planes. It's very important that you only really code in one of these two orientations. If you make one part of your code that looks good in XZ, it'll probably look terrible in XY. So you do not want to mix making code in both XY and in XZ. On that note, make sure to leave your code in that desired orientation so that when someone opens up your file, you see the right orientation that you're supposed to read the level in. Another common mistake is to scale up the level to be very, very large. 
So here I'm zoomed out as far as possible. So when different parts of the level are very, very large, this is as much as I can see from a bird's eye view. All right, I can only see like a little bit larger than the camera in one shot. This makes it a lot harder to navigate around the level and see what's going on. Before I go on to show you tricks to make your code a lot less messy, some people say that, you know, it's always going to be messy because this is a 2D programming software. While this will be true to an extent, there are all sorts of tricks that we can use to make our code look a lot cleaner. And if your code looks like this, that's not Nintendo's fault. That's, that's you. you, you did this. My first major piece of advice is that in GBG, most nodons take an input on the left and an output on the right. So the most natural way to make your code legible is to write it from left to right. For example, here you can clearly read this code left to right because first we have a comparison followed by a counter, then a map, angle to position, node on, maps, etc. It's important to note here that these pink lines almost always go left to right. If anything, this code's legibility can be improved by moving this wormhole node on over to the left. Furthermore, it can be confusing when you have one big pink line that goes through very many nodons. For example, here, this pink line goes all the way from this map to this inversion nodon. This can be made more legible by moving it up and slightly out of the way, so it's no longer ambiguous where those pink lines are leading to. You might say, well, Loop, you can't always make code that reads left to right if it loops around on itself. That is true, but I also have some bad news for you, which is that GBG is generally not designed to work well with loops. You can make code that loops back on itself, but it also creates a lot of confusion. Here, I have a very simple case for demonstration. I have two knots feeding into each other. So in theory, when this knot gets no input, it should turn to one, which should flicker this knot to off, back and forth forever, but never triggers from zero. So these two things just stay always off forever, which is not how a knot nodon works. You see similar oddities happening with flags and counters, which are the main nodons that people like to spam in loops. The main issue is that when you have two inputs going to the same cycle on one frame, this creates ambiguity and jank because you don't exactly know what's gonna happen. There are some situations where you do want to have your code loop back on itself, but if you find yourself with many loops, you're probably doing it wrong. My next tip is that even though it's generally a bad idea to stack nodons on top of each other because it makes it hard to read, if you have many of the exact same node on that have to be just wired up differently, it can be helpful to neatly stack them in this way if their functions are similar enough in order to keep everything organized. Another trick that helps is to align your node ons. For example, here you'll find chains of node ons that are exactly at the same vertical position, i.e. you don't have some node ons off of this line for no reason. Furthermore, many node ons will be horizontally aligned to be on the same like vertical line. And this helps a lot keeping track of this happens, then these nodons happen, and then after that, which aids in reading left to right. The next major trick is to keep your code into small little chunks, little blocks of code that each individually do one simple or singular task. This makes it a lot easier to follow this code. For reference, this is what that code looks like if you don't put it into small bite-sized chunks. You can no longer tell where one task starts and ends. So it just reads as one giant mess of algebra. Another major trick is to be aware of wormholes. They have both upsides and downsides. The downside is that when you use a wormhole, you have no real way of figuring out where this Y is without digging through the rest of the code. Like where is the Y, where is it defined, etc. You can't use a control F. So it's very helpful to have every single wormhole that you use defined at least in a comment. Some viewers have told me that if you just change the letter of the wormhole, then you don't need a comment because it's self-explanatory. Like X is the diver's X position. Any programmer or developer will immediately tell you that single letter variable names are basically useless. <laughs> For example, here in this code, what is P? What is B? Where do they go? What do they do? Who knows? My advice to you is that whenever you use a wormhole node on, it needs to be accompanied with some sort of comment that tells you what it does. In general, you want to use wormhole nodons as infrequently as possible because they make your code a lot harder to read because it's a lot harder to go out and find what that wormhole nodon is supposed to be. In contrast, wormhole nodons add a lot of value to your level when you are reusing that same value for that wormhole many, many times over, like a variable. For example, this cow level has two wormholes. One of them is for whether or not the game has started yet. This J wormhole is used to control the music and the auto scroll. Again, here to initiate the IR controls. Once more to turn on the level's timer, 
another time to turn on the penalty system, and once more to turn on character select. Because this wormhole is going to be used many times in the level, it will add a lot of value to not have big pink connections going all across the level, all to one flag. When making a 2D level with a 3D background, a lot of that is going to show, so just be very careful with this. For example, this version has no 3D background, while this version has a ton of textures in the background that make it much harder to read. Another trick is that whenever you have an object with an anchor point, which is a, an immovable spot so that you have like a slider or something to it, it's a lot easier to make your code more legible if everything is assembled off screen. So here, the game screen has this very elaborate tank. The tank is placed here in the original game screen, attached to this anchor point, where all of this code that's associated with the tank is completely outside of the gameplay area. So it makes it a lot easier for me to look at the gameplay area and understand what I'm doing. Furthermore, in general, you'll notice a lot of clutter comes from textures, especially when you're trying to very efficiently reuse the exact same texture many times. Here in this closer shot, you see a ton of blue lines connecting to that one single texture. While this can be efficient in terms of nodons, it also makes a huge mess. Sometimes it's better to duplicate your texture in multiple regions, as opposed to having one texture that makes your entire level look like spaghetti. These four boxes are connected to this one texture, but then these boxes are also connected to their own separate sand texture, which is actually the same exact texture. While this costs nodons, if you use this strategically, you can very dramatically reduce the amount of clutter in your level without also spending a ton of nodons to do it. Sometimes you'll have an area that is way too large to cover with a single comet nodon because it has a maximum size limit. In this situation, you can use a very small comet nodon, so here it shows text that you can assume applies to this general area. Another very helpful piece of advice is to make your code require fewer nodons in general. If you do the same thing more efficiently, then there's less code to organize. Here, for example, this 2D marker nodon saves very, very many comparison statements that no longer need to be made. And without all those comparison nodons, there are now a lot fewer comparisons that you actually do need to have in the code. So in general, making your code more efficient also makes it a lot cleaner. Furthermore, it greatly helps to organize your nodons to be very symmetric. So here you have all these arrangements of nodons in lines that are perfectly aligned. And so even though you have a ton of blue lines coming into this gameplay area, because they all run parallel, it's a lot easier to follow this pattern. So when you see a line that's not parallel to that pattern, you can tell that this blue line is something that's completely different from these. There's so much more we could discuss on this topic, but I feel like you get the general idea. I'm no paragon of perfection, but I would say that this is generally understandable. No one was born making good, clean code, all right? This comes through practice, and most importantly, trying things out and seeing what works to make your code a lot more legible. But the most important thing is to try. Please put effort into making your code legible so that you also do not suffer the consequences of not being able to understand what you made. And with that, I'm out of breath for today, all right? If you disagree with me, come to my stream and feel free to argue with me all you like. But for now, that's all I got for you today. I'll see you around, guys. Later. Mm -hmm.